Okay, there we go. Hey, guys, welcome. It's uh, June 19th. I'm sitting in my bunker in my green screen room here with aliens behind me and above me and uh, below me. That doesn't sound right. Hey, um, first of all, I don't know about you guys, but uh, even as a kid, one of the things that always intrigued me was this. UFOs, aliens, technology. I watched, I think, almost everything that existed in this world. Uh, Oh my goodness! I can't begin to tell you. I've watched Ancient Aliens from now all the way back to the, back in the days of the '70s when they came out with all kinds of uh, great. The first movie, and uh, Von Donikin. Anyone that's into Aliens will know what I'm talking about. Anyone else will be looking at me like, "PC has been talking to this puppet for years," and I guess he's nuts. So <laughs> whatever you want to think is fine by me. However, uh, this man is one of the guys I've been reading for many, many years. He has nine books out on UFOs, uh, and he's a brilliant man. And uh, we have an extra guest who tonight coming in as well. I could probably talk to this man forever and ever and ever. Um, this gentleman was employed by the MOD. For you people that don't understand what MOD stands for, that's the Ministry of Defense, for 21 years. And I think for three or four years of, the, of those years, he investigated sightings to find out whether they were threats to the national security of England. Uh, he's an author, a journalist, and a TV personality. Uh, he used to investigate UFOs and other mysteries for the British government and is the world's leading expert on UFOs, the unexplained, and conspiracy theories. Uh, he has presented and contributed to and consulted on numerous television shows on these subjects. And I think he's been on Fox News. I've, I've probably seen him 15 times on Fox News. Uh, and I'm sure he's going to be back on again soon because... President Trump said today. So I'd like to give a nice warm welcome to, I think, uh, someone that everyone probably knows, especially if it have anything to do with UFOs. It's Nick Pope. And there you go. I give you some creepy music coming in. Can you hear me, Nick? Yes, I can. Thank you. Coming through loud and clear. Excellent. Great. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, I'm hoping the connection will hold. I, I'm speaking to you from Tucson, Arizona. We have a, a big fire, and I know the power company is kind of um, occasionally dropping the power, but it's in, it's in all the news, uh, the Bighorn Fire. It's quite a big thing over here, but uh, look, fingers crossed. Keep our fingers crossed. Either that or we could always blame it on uh, the government trying to interfere with your information today. The men in black are watching. <laughs> yes. Uh, first of all, you know, bef and before I even get into everything with you, thank you for coming on and doing this. I'm a big fan of yours for many years, and I read several of your books, and I am always been intrigued and amazed at this whole all this UFO stuff. And so, before we even get into the really great nitty gritty stuff that I know you know everything about, I wanted to start off with just like the very beginning um, in the be in your life. How did you first come into this? I mean, obviously, working for the MOD brought you in uh, as a someone to look at what's going on. But prior to that, did you have any knowledge or information about this or it just kind of was thrown on you when as part of your job in the MOD? I had no previous interest in this subject at all. And um, I think probably I'd seen the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I'd read War of the Worlds, and that was probably about it. So I had joined the Ministry of Defense. I had been in for several years. I'd already had two or three different postings. And in July 1991, uh, they just put me into the UFO job. And that's something I did for the next three years. So, so I came at it, I suppose, with an open mind. And probably the best way to go into that, actually, I don't think they want either a believer or, or a skeptic in there, to sure. be honest. Sure. Uh, so so you were thrust into it, essentially. And when you start looking into all these things, did your opinions start to change rapidly at that point? Or or did it take a long time? Because I'm, I'm interested in knowing what who was Nick Pope just prior to that 
And then has your opinion changed over time as you went through the program of the MOD working with them? Well, I was, in terms of who I was and who I am, I guess uh, I was a civilian employee of the Ministry of Defense, which is essentially just the UK's equivalent of the DOD here in the US. Yeah. And I, don't, I was, I guess, a fairly no-nonsense kind of person, um, straight down the line by the book. I'd had jobs which had to do, you know, regular executive level jobs in, in the department, briefing uh, senior officials, um, you know, that sort of thing. During the Persian Gulf War, I'd been seconded into the Air Force Operations Room in the Joint Operations Center as a briefer. And then I was just hit with this UFO thing. And to answer your question, I think it was gradual. I started off thinking, well, you know, most of this is just aircraft lights and weather balloons and satellites and things like that. But gradually, I, I began to, we got about two or 300 cases a year, hit some more interesting ones. And also, of course, I had access to the vast archive of files. Somebody had been doing this job, I, many, many different people over the years since 1953. And gradually, I began to think, wait a minute, there's something a little bit more mysterious about some of this. I see. And and uh, prior to this, though, you, you you said you came in with actually not having a belief or, or disbelief. <clears throat> but now over the time, what is your MO now? Do you have beliefs or you don't have belief? I mean, after all these years of research, what is your belief or non-belief of this? Well, life out there, absolutely. Yes. And we've seen some great stories about that just literally in the last few days. But um, life visiting us down here, we don't have a smoking gun. Or if we do, the president hasn't shared that with me. Um, mm -hmm. So lots of intriguing evidence, but no definitive you can take it to the bank proof. So I'm, I'm open-minded about the possibilities. I love hearing that, by the way. And what is your beliefs in, and, and I know this is a little off of a question comparison, but what is your beliefs in, let's say, religion? Are you a religious person? Because I think that a lot of people wonder how that bleeds into a person looking on the outside. What do they believe on the inside? I'm not religious at all, actually. I'm, I'm an atheist. It's, I, it's funny. It's one of the first times, if not the first time, that question's actually come up. And it's, it's <laughs> funny because it, it is, given that people talk about the UFO phenomenon in terms of belief, it is um, a, an interesting question. I'm, I'm staggered that I think you're the first one to ask me. I'm happy to be the person asking something unique rather than the typical. But I, actually, I want to start with the typical and get into a little bit of deeper of, of other things because, because you know, everyone can purchase your books and probably seen you speak. But, you know, religion is a, is a really interesting thing because some people that are very religious look at aliens and think, well, this is not something that is part of their paradigm. And then all of a sudden, the things like the Catholic Church years ago came out. So, well, if there are aliens they and they do exist in the world, that they're probably... Catholic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, so, I mean, it's kind of like everyone has to put their little take on it. And then there's other people like yourself that you say they're not religious at all. And if you're not, um, how does that skew the perception towards looking at this type of material? There's definitely a, 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 a periscope that you're looking down in order to, with your own stuff that you're bringing into this, you know? Uh, so religion is a, is, a, is a good question. In addition to that, if there are these aliens around what do you think the agenda is? Do you have any idea of what you would believe the agenda would be? Well, some big questions there. Let me take it back and just say a couple of things about the religion. Sure. It won't surprise you to learn. I mean, I went to a couple of Royal Society discussion meetings mm -hmm. about what's going to happen if and when we discover extraterrestrial life or, or if it discovers us. Um, mm -hmm back in the UK in 2010. It won't surprise you to learn that probably the most heated discussion of all was about religion. Would extraterrestrials have a concept of religion or would they regard it as superstition? Would they perhaps have a greater spiritual co uh, connection with with a God, if if there is a God? So, I mean, all this all this came up. And, and something else which is quite interesting if you followed the story about the Pentagon's mysterious ATIP program, yeah. Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, 
Well, one of the things that Lou Elizondo has said, and I came across it in the UK as well, actually, is that there are some people in government who are pretty religious, but a fairly conservative religion. And they take the view that uh, UFOs are demonic. And, and this yeah. apparently, there's a, a passage in the Bible. I think it's uh, Ephesians and it describes Satan. And it uses the phrase, the prince of the power of the air. And for that reason, quite a lot of religious people have convinced themselves that the UFO phenomenon is demonic. So the skepticism sometimes in government isn't this is all nonsense and we don't believe it. It's It might be true, but if so, it's demonic and you shouldn't feed that energy. So that's interesting. Let me, huh. let me just go to your other question about yes. what might the agenda might be. If we're being visited by intelligent extraterrestrials, uh, the technology you need for interstellar travel is is way ahead of anything we've got. I mean, we've just about kind of gotten to the moon and Mars and sent a couple of probes to the fringes of the solar system. At the speed we're going, it would take 75,000 years to get to the nearest star. So, look, we're not going to have anything to teach these people about science and technology. So I think it's just a guess. But if we're being visited, I suspect they're coming here as cultural anthropologists to look at us, to look at the structures and societies that we have, and in fact, to look at the biological diversity of, of planet Earth. That's really a wonderful answer, by the way. And I, I but when we think about something benevolent or malevolent, um, and, and wow. My mind is a little blown here for a second because I because I I have my own, I have a million questions I wanted to interject as you've been speaking because I'm thinking as I'm thinking about it it's it's actually putting me into all these different directions. The first one being is if these people are just if the people if these aliens or whatever they may be are looking at us to see what kind of society we're growing from, and it would take this long for them to get and travel through space. What about that's based on the knowledge that we have of physics that we understand as human beings today through a limited capacity. We're looking at it through the, again, a view of a small window frame that we see that the way reality works. But as you increase that frame, reality can work in a lot more different ways that don't make it that length of time for someone to travel across a universe. That's our physics are limited where their physics may be so unlimited that Perhaps it, it's instantaneous for all we know. Yes. I mean, you make a very good point. A couple of hundred years ago, um, the fastest way that we got around was on horseback at not very many miles an hour. And now, of course, we're in an era of space probe and stealth fighter. And, and you know, one wonders what the next 200 years will bring. And sure, our understanding of the laws of physics constantly evolves and things that theoretical physicists uh, are looking at today, um, you know, would have been considered science fiction maybe five, 10 years ago. And things that we will have in 10, 20 years will be regarded as sci-fi now. And it's interesting, actually, if you look at the letter the Defense Intelligence Agency sent Congress about the Pentagon's ATIP program. Yes. They listed 38 studies, and one of them was on warp drive, one of them was on wormholes, and one of them was on stargates. Well, this, this would have been regarded as crazy a few years ago, and now the government's looking at it. You know, I was looking into that Tic Tac uh, information, and apparently the sightings, first one was 2004 in San Diego, if I'm, am I correct? And then I think it was 2015. Um, uh, two, 2004 was the, the Tic Tac incident. That's that's actually, that was the West Coast incident. Yeah. Then there was 2015, the two other ones. That that was, yeah, that was East Coast. Uh, but they're, they're, um, they're all interesting videos. And of course, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I don't think anyone's pretending there are just three occasions where military pilots have seen, chased, and filmed UFOs. And, and of course, you'll remember that last year in April, the US Navy announced that they'd 
issued guidance to their own people telling them what to do if they encounter these things, not because they've had three sightings, but because they have what they describe as an ongoing series of incursions into restricted military airspace. And I have a picture here of, of it. I, a lot of people are very familiar with this, or, and some people are totally not, but that's what it looks like from the pilot's perspective. And I was looking into this too, and apparently the Pentagon released footage of this and they claimed there was not a threat or to our security, which when I, I it's almost hilarious. I don't know when you see something flying around in the air in our airspace or anyone's airspace, you don't know what it is and it doesn't behave in normal ways that of anything of flight, how it's not a threat. Is, is ridiculous to me, but I have well, a feeling that the government's got their hands tied in velvet handcuffs. They feel they feel like they can't say it's a threat because then you were like, what are we paying our taxes for? If you for, we're supposed to be protected by them, and they, they can't be look they can't look foolish. No, you never want to imply that you've lost control of your own airspace. Yeah, and and when military personnel are tracking these things on radar, doing extraordinary speeds and maneuvers. And then when the pilots chase them, can't get close to them, but film them on the forward looking infrared camera. And when the pilot or one of them turned around and said, I don't know what the heck it is, but I want to fly one. I mean, that, <laughs> that should tell you something. I think when they say there's no threat, they're being slightly disingenuous. They're doing what we did in the Ministry of Defense. Um, we're kind of slightly changing the definition of threat to mean there's no evidence of overt hostility, which is correct. However, that's not how you really are supposed to define threat. In the military, a threat is defined as capability times intent. We know the capability looks pretty impressive. We have no idea what the, content, the, the intent is. Therefore, we can't with hand on heart say whether there is or isn't a threat. So it's it's disingenuous to dismiss the threat. And it seems being being done worldwide. And the pilot that was on that particular craft flying, he said his name is uh, Mr. David Fravor, I believe is the correct name. He had stated it's it had an incredible performance characteristics, uh, characteristics that were well beyond brand new Super Hornet right out of the factory, which is uh, what the jets that they, they were flying. So our, our most modern technology was dwarfed by something that they could not even describe, which leads me to think then, could it be our own technology uh, advanced that we're not aware of? Is such maybe such a, a new technology perhaps that the, the US government has put out and they wanna make us believe that they don't know what it is because they're testing it or is it perhaps off planet? Well, it is interesting. In in the shadowy world of intelligence, sometimes for sure you want to to hide a capability that you have, and and sometimes indeed talk up a capability you don't have. Sure. But uh, I, I think you know, with the official position of the United States government is these things remain unidentified. Uh, and yeah, there's there, there there are about five or six different theories. Uh, our own technology, some secret prototype black project, uh, aircraft, missile, drone, but our own tech. Uh, other theories that it's Russia or China, or that it's a non-state actor, someone like Elon Musk testing something. Um, yeah, and, and absolutely, then you get into the more exotic theories, uh, which is everything from, from extraterrestrial, time travelers, interdimensional, demonic. Uh, I mean, you name it, people have got theories. What I will say is this, somebody in government will have what is generally called a best current assessment. So mm -hmm. even though technically they may be truthful when they say we, we don't know, there'll be a best current assessment because look, the president's been briefed on this, uh, various senators on the armed services committee and the intelligence committee have been briefed. And you don't go into those briefings and go, we don't know, and then pack up and leave sure. because you get called back and it's like, wait a minute, you know, what's what's your best guess? Even if it is literally a guess, but you will go down the different theories and you will assign them orders of probability. And I've briefed uh, government, you know, senior government uh, defense ministers and, and min military personnel. I know how briefing works. Wow, that's fascinating that you're saying that too. And and I think um, what, when I think about that, 
is it possible too that prime ministers and presidents of like the United States and other countries actually do or do not know the top intelligence and there's a shadow government that does? I mean, again, it goes down a conspiracy lane, but is it possible that there are actually information being not opened up to in, you know, in politics and there's some other shadow government that really runs and knows what's really going on, making deals behind everyone's back. It, it is interesting that most of the work of the Pentagon's ATIP program was contracted out into the private sector to Bigelow Aerospace. And we did a similar thing in the UK with some of our sensitive programs. Um, it gives them an extra layer. It makes congressional oversight more difficult, takes it even further out side of the scope of the Freedom of Information Act, that kind of thing. Um, having said that, I'm not one of these people that, that thinks presidents don't know. And, and here's why. I, any incoming president needs to know what I would call all the big strategic issues because of what we in the UK, I don't know if you use this phrase in, mm -hmm. in the US, but we call it the culture of no surprises. The president, as commander in chief, can't suddenly be told, um, you know, sir, the situation with the extraterrestrials has has turned a little bit difficult. Only for the president to look at you and say, "What extraterrestrials?" So you you may, you, in terms of plausible deniability, you may want to protect the president from some things, but big strategic things. Let let me give one other example. Sure. If if we had, if we had a spy, say in the Politburo, the president would not. Well, it wouldn't. It's not need. Wouldn't want to know who it was, but would need to know that we had one because that helps him assess how reliable strate strategic intelligence that we're getting on Russia um, would be. So. You need to know the big things, but not necessarily the, the little specific things. And yeah. believe me when I say, if we're being visited by extraterrestrials, that's a big thing. And every president would have to know. So I don't have any truck with anyone who says, oh, no, this is above presidents. No, See. if it's real, the president would know on day one. I super appreciate your opinion on that because it's something I've been thinking about for years. And I'm going to bring, bring in my friend John in just a few minutes. John, your video is not on just to let you know. Hey, somebody just mentioned here, uh, and I'd like to ask you three simple, quick questions too, but this is this is a, qu a good question as well. Um, this gentleman asked, what does he think of Paul Hellyer? Well, I've met, yeah, I've met Paul Hellyer um, two, three, four times maybe over the years, former uh, defense Secretary of Canada and indeed Deputy Prime Minister for a, a while. Uh, now, my goodness, uh, what is he? 93, 94, something, something yeah. like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, a, a real deep specialist on uh, monetary and fiscal policy, but um, very outspoken believer in an extraterrestrial presence. Um, by his own admission, to answer the question, by his own admission, he has not seen anything himself in terms of of either ufos or or even uh documentation when he was in government he his belief in this comes from things he's been told afterwards but when he says he's been told by reliable sources in the u.s government that roswell was real and uh, and there's a lot to this then i think people should pay attention of course. Uh, I want to ask you just a couple of quick questions before I bring John in here. And John, I think you need to turn your video on. Your device is not connected. Um, is there an Area 51 location in the UK? I'm not aware of that. Is like, an, like we had the Area 51. Was there a location in the UK that was similar? There, there are uh, several places where we test secret prototype aircraft and drones and, and missiles. Um, but just because of the small geographical size of the the UK, I mean, you can be in one of these uh, really fast jets and you can cross the the UK from West Coast to East in, in minutes. So mm -hmm. um, we don't really have the big areas, but we, we have some places, um, it's some of them over the land, but actually some of the, the 
ranges and um, uh, test areas are actually out over the ocean. Um, but I, I'm not sure I would characterize it as quite an equivalent of Area 51, but it's close. I was saying like a hidden, like people didn't know about it till later on, like they did here. They, they denied everything later on. I said, all right, it's there. You know, it was denial. Um, also, you know, has anyone ever, this is a strange question. I, I feel awkward asking you, but has anyone ever said, Nick, Mr. Pope, you're a disinformation agent? <laughs> I'm sure. well, yeah, no, it's it's a question that comes up actually oh. a lot. And okay. if if you search the Internet for phrases like Nick Pope still secretly working for the government, you yeah. will find a lot of stuff. I mean, there, there are two kind of parallel theories about this. The first mm -hmm. is that I'm a disinformation agent and and the information I'm putting out is is literally false to throw people off the trail. The related, slightly different conspiracy theory is that I'm the friendly face of a sort of soft disclosure. Right. And, and that I, and perhaps one or two other people, um, am slowly, I guess, acclimatizing people to the reality of this. Um, well. Partly, you know, part of it being sci-fi films as well, partly you know, the British government declassified and released 60,000 pages of documents from my old job. So, and I came out of retirement to help with that. So, so you know, maybe you don't ever completely leave, but no, I, I mean, I'm, I've heard those theories. I'm not still secretly on the pay, payroll, I but, see. but look, if I was, I'd probably say the same thing, wouldn't I? Of course you would. <laughs> Actually, would. I, I was. I was asking that awkwardly as well, but I'm happy to hear your answer. I wasn't sure. I don't want to offend you with that. I just thought of. I was thinking about it, and I, I didn't look on the internet about that either. Quick question: Men in Black. What do you think about Men in Black? Well, over the years, sure, it's been alleged that these sinister, black-clad individuals have gone around silencing UFO witnesses. Some people say they're government officials. Other people say that they are extraterrestrials. Um, I'm not I'm not convinced. I won't say that over the years, the odd G man and G woman hasn't turned up as part of a government investigation and said, look, probably wise if you don't talk about this too openly, but but not really in that sinister a way. Um, just sometimes, well, that's that's government for you. Default is. position is say nothing if you can get away with it and try and encourage other people to do the same and maybe try and kill kill an awkward story, um, stop it getting to the media, that sort of thing. One other quick question, uh, and, I, and this is probably not a quick question because it's hard to express it even as a question clearly, but I, I've, I've researched a lot about the simulation theories about the world that we live in being a simulation. There's a lot of people talking about it more now than ever. and. Um, when you start looking into simulation theory, you start to think about how the universe works. And there's a lot of physics involved in all of that. And then all of a sudden the alien agenda becomes a whole different, larger connected sort of puzzle that starts to make a little more, I mean, you could, you could put a puzzle together that makes sense with a simulation theory based on, with alien agenda involved in it. And then, and then it goes into conspiratorial things where people say, well, there's aliens that exist in the world and they're actually using our energy to be fed upon. And, there's, and it goes into all this um, deeper and deeper, I guess, esoteric kind of, I don't know if it's mumbo jumbo or if it's just um, great storytelling. It's great storytelling. It's mind provoking thought process. But um, what do you have any, I guess, opinion on this simulation theory and the idea that there's an agenda of aliens eating our energies and using us to be angry and upset for food. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, question. I'm sorry. It's a no, question. I've, I've followed this idea. And I mean, of course, it is almost literally a sort of um, theoretical physics interpretation of the Matrix movie. Kind of. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I, I've absolutely um, uh, followed the debate about this with some interest. I've seen recently uh, theoretical physics and cosmologists talk about 
for example, information theory and talking about information as being a fundamental property of, of the universe and, and, um, and therefore looking at information in terms and, and cosmology in terms of, say, computer science. And it is interesting. There are some synergies. I don't have any degree of deep specialist knowledge on this. I just follow it as a, a lay person. I mean, there are various different interpretations of this. Yeah. I mean, one, one is that, yeah, uh, reality is a, essentially a, a, a construct or, or that the universe as we perceive it as a simulation, maybe to keep us isolated from what's really out there. Uh, but, but other people take the view almost literally that we, we may just be in a, a sort of extraterrestrial uh, video game. And and that uh, you know like avatars or um, computer simulations and that 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 they're just moving us around the screen and uh, we every now and then we jump over a mushroom and grab a magic like bag of money or some, whatever it is. <laughs> well, isn't, it, isn't, isn't it what we're really doing in our life in a sense? Essentially, anyway. Yeah. And really? and then you get you you get these people being a little bit clever with this and they say and. At the point we start to figure out that that this is just a simulation, it, it's like all it's like all bets are off, and maybe there's not much point in keeping it hidden anymore. Or as you get towards the end of the game, really unlikely things start to happen, and and you look around at the the last you know three four years, and you think really and um, <laughs> yeah and and. Um, all sorts of things that might have been considered low probability outcomes seem to be happening. And, uh, and that's inf interesting to look at um, simulation theory with, with that in mind. So who knows? I think that the greatest part about the simulation theory, I, I heard from somebody state that they believe that it is like a video game so that as you walk through life, all the scenery that you look around and see in front of you is being rendered in front of you because data is taking up lots of data. So the data has to be presented in front of you as you go through life. And they said, if you could turn your head around quick enough, if you could, you'd actually see it wasn't there. It's only there being rendered as you as you actually move forward through reality, which is well, a fascinating concept to think about, you know? Yeah, and and you know, the the as ever, there's an interesting area where theoretical physics meets philosophy because yeah. that idea is not a million miles away from if a tree falls over in a forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? And, yeah. and then you're almost inevitably driven towards a debate about consciousness and the level of consciousness, the mind body split, et cetera, et cetera. And what comes in after that? Religion, God, beliefs. And by the way, this is another thing I was telling John, I'm gonna bring him on right now. Another thing, I remember years ago reading a book by Wayne Dyer and one of the things that stuck in my head so strongly was he said there was two things in life. There's things that are beliefs and knowings. And I remember thinking a lot about this because believing in aliens, you're, now you write books about it. So you have certain facts and that's what you base your opinions on is the facts. But there's the difference between that fact and something in knowing. A, a religious belief is a belief that I, somebody's handed to me and said, here, listen to this. This is what you should believe in. And then you encompass that and go through your life believing whatever it is that you've, the paradigm you've given or the, but as a, a knowing is a big difference. A person, let's say that's been abducted or a person that goes out and knows when they jump in the pool, they get wet. They know it, that when you jump in water, you get wet or you touch fire, you get burned. The knowing is so much different than a belief and in this business of UFOs and ufology, there's a lot of people that have beliefs, but the knowings is very limited. And I find that to be a really important point in, in this realm that's not expressed enough. Yes, I, I mean, I going right back to my Ministry of Defense investigations, I tried always to be data led, uh, not belief led in this. I mean, inevitably belief gets tangled up in it but at the end of the day your your you know analogy about jumping into a pool or something i mean in one sense you could say that that's uh, something that would tie in with the scientific method in terms of repeatability i mean every time you you can you make a hypothesis that 
that water is wet and if you jump in the pool, you'll get wet. Then you design an experiment, which is that you jump in, and then you must be able to replicate your results. And every time you jump in, you will get wet. Now, so you could say that that isn't so much belief, uh, or, or if it is, it's belief that stems from the scientific method. Whereas something like abduction, where you wouldn't necessarily, you know, if the individual who had this experience may passionately, genuinely, truthfully believe they've had that experience, but unless they could repeat it like on demand, um, it's belief. So, yeah, it it it's belief. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. I mean, I'm not trying to disparage it and and write it off, but I'm saying it is difficult to reconcile with the scientific method. I agree with you, and sometimes beliefs you have to have a belief in order to achieve a knowing because when you when you're closed to going towards something being so closed doesn't allow it to happen so sometimes you need a belief in order to experience a miracle in my in my mind's view and, and there's not a lot of pragmatic logic to that but because just what you said about experimenting but you're right, absolutely right it's fascinating and and i love i could go down this road for hours but i need to bring in john now, John Galasso is the booker of my show, who books all the um, talent, and he was kind enough to get you. So I'm gonna, I'd like to bring in John Galasso. And John um, is, as a matter of fact, we, we've spoken for hours and hours on just, let's say, Rendell Shafaris from your book. <laughs> so we, I'd like to bring him in. So here he is, this is John Galasso. Come on in, Johnny. There you go. Hey, guys. Hi, Nick, good seeing you again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you. All right. Well, I basically just want to touch on some of the things that you guys have discussed already. And, you know, one one of the the cases that you, uh, you've you talked about, like, it was like a famous case from 1952 where UFOs were spotted over Washington. And um, Lieutenant William Patterson, he was in a, he was in a, sent up in a fighter jet to actually uh, see what these objects were. And he said there were four white glows. And at one point they surrounded him and um, they got away. And he said that they were going moving so rapidly that he wasn't able to um, catch up to them. And later on when they asked uh, for uh, an answer to what this was, the government said uh, that it was a, a temperature inversion and just some of the answers that they give are just so unbelievable. And he insisted that it was an, it was an ob, these were objects. And it seems like that, uh, you know, to have UFOs that are spotted over Washington, how do you just, uh, like, just dismiss that? Well, sure. I don't think the government has done itself any favors over the years. There was another famous case where where the uh, Project Blue Book scientific advisor dismissed it as swamp gas. And, and that became almost like a, a meme for government debunking. And uh, then there's a mysterious tradition in government circles, both in the US and the UK, for uh, Im important documents to go missing. Uh, one time we had a Navy case in the UK and uh, we were trying to get hold of the ship's log uh, for the period when this sighting had taken place. And we were told that uh, there had been a sudden strong gust of wind and it had blown the ship's log overboard. Uh, now, I spoke to an admiral who, I, I mean, not just any old admiral, by the way, Britain's former chief of the defense staff, so equivalent of your chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And uh, he rolled his eyes and said, you know, I served 40 years in the Navy. I have never heard of a, a ship's log blowing overboard. And uh, he was outraged that, of course, just when we thought we were closing in on interesting documentary evidence of this UFO sighting, along came this unlikely excuse. So, yeah, it's uh, temperature inversions, swamp gas, uh, sudden gusts of strong wind. Um, yeah, it's... It's a little embarrassing. Well, you know what I find interesting that all these different uh, situations, 
like this sighting led to the, the Robinson panel. Uh, and all these investigations always end up the same way. They always say that uh, upon investigation, it was not a, a, a defense, anything uh, significant to the defense of the country. And, and based on that, they say like, it's just kind of like just basically dismissed. But if, if you don't, and I know you guys referred to this before, but if you don't know what something is, how can you claim that it's not a threat if you don't know what it is? Uh, no, I completely agree. And, and of course, I, I discussed the military defining threat as capability times intent. I mean, sometimes uh, no defense significance or, or no over threat or, or we, it's a fancy way in this circumstance of saying we don't know. Now, yesterday, of course, we saw this, this interview that President Trump gave uh, to, to one of his sons uh, about this. And um, he teased a bit of an answer about Roswell and people have speculated, well, does does the US government have something? And, and here's the thing, if there is what I would call literally a sort of spaceship in a hangar smoking gun, then sure, I mean, the government can, if it chooses, disclose. But if that's not the situation, if it's a little bit more nebulous, pilots see these things and chase them and film them. Radar operators track them. Um, every now and then there are near misses with commercial airlines. Um, a whole bunch of these cases over the years, but no one actually has hardware. If that's the position we're in, then government is in a, a bit of a difficult situation because what do you do? No government likes to say we don't know. It makes you look weak and stupid. And governments, governments derive their power and authority from projecting strength. And, and as I said earlier, no, no one's going to think you're particularly strong if, if it looks like you've lost control of your skies. You know, Nick, you had said, actually, you were quoted as saying that there could be 36 intelligent civilizations out there, and that would make up 72 trillion such civilizations in the universe. With, with those kind of odds, how could it be that we're the only uh, civilization that has the only world with his life? Absolutely, I agree. And now the, the interesting thing about this story was that it started off, I know this sounds funny, but it started off almost as a skeptical story because there, there's something called the Drake equation, which was designed by the astronomer uh, Frank Drake. And it was an attempt to estimate how many communicable civilizations there might be in our Milky Way galaxy. And over the years, there have been different interpretations of, of the values in the Drake equation. And people estimated the solution, uh, just off the top of my head, I think, as being between 10,000 and 20,000 civilizations in our galaxy. So this scientific paper that got published um, recently, it was a skeptical paper because it said, well, there might not be 10 or 20,000. There might only be 36. So life might be much rarer than we think. And then I said, wait a minute. If you take 36 and then multiply it by the number of estimated galaxies in the universe, it still comes to 72 trillion <laughs> civilizations. <laughs> so that doesn't sound, yeah, when you, it, when you take into account the vastness of the observable universe, and that's just the observable universe, um, suddenly these, these stories take on a very different perspective. And for all the people who say, what do you think the aliens are like? Or, or what might the aliens be doing? I say, what do you mean the aliens? You think there's only one other civilization in the universe? Um, there's probably a whole bunch of them. And, and of course, this, this latest... Uh, paper bears that out, even though, as I say, it started off almost as a rare earth paper, suggesting complex life might be very, very rare. And, and it is 
<laughs> Alien lives matter. I can see the protests right now. <laughs> oh, I better not go down that route. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just being, I want to be time sensitive for this interview because I, like John had said earlier, I mean, I could talk to you. I have, I have 5,000 questions I'd like to ask you, but to be time sensitive, what do you say to the skeptics who say like, uh, I know like uh, Manhattan, there's no parking, but how come like you never see a UFO like land in Manhattan and they're always in like a rural area somewhere? Now, I do believe that there's something more, but I, I understand the skeptic's point of view. Like how come they just, you know, they're always in these areas where it's like a gray area and you don't see one just land on like Times Square? Well, that they don't land in Times Square or, or on the White House lawn, but there are have been over the years plenty of sightings over major cities. Uh, I mean, um, we, we just uh, talked very briefly about the Washington, D.C. case yes. from 52. But um, uh, yeah, as to why they don't land on the White House lawn or, or anywhere and make open contact, one one is inexorably drawn towards the idea of some sort of Star Trek prime directive theory, where if they are coming here as, as scientists, well, you don't want to put yourself in the experiment. Um, if they're coming here as biologists, the best wildlife documentaries are the ones where the, amaras, uh, the animals don't see the cameras and don't, don't kind of end up in this sort of artificial environment and the best cultural anthropology is done when the the civilization you're not interacting you, you know you're interacting with is not aware because then you're seeing them in their natural um, environment and their natural behaviors and the moment you land you get what i call cultural contamination and uh, you'd end up we see it here on planet earth of course now everyone wears the the same sort of branded T-shirts and drinks the same branded sodas. Um, you know, every planet is probably unique, but the moment you have open contact, you'll lose that. And, and maybe extraterrestrial civilizations want to preserve it as long as they can. And until we get to the point where we'll be able to kind of figure it out or, or find them through science and astronomy. And we're nearly there. That's okay. a great answer. I, you guys touched on this too, and I just like to just add to that. Uh, John asked you about the men in black, and you've dealt with so many sensitive uh, investigations and with your background and everything. Has anybody ever, and I'm not saying men in black, but just anyone in general, has anybody ever like knocked on your door and said, hey, Nick, you're a nice guy, but like back off like you're crossing the line here like this you we will allow you to investigate certain things but other things are just like off limits and maybe like you're crossing the line in certain areas where you know maybe this is just you know something that we just don't want you to and i'm not saying men in black but just anyone in general if you're even able to answer that like is there another group of people or i know we talked about a shadowy government or but is there anyone else that maybe might say, hey, Nick, you know, listen, we don't need to talk about this. Sure. Well, I can't really talk about what groupings there may be in the United States because all my government work on this, of course, was with the British government. In the UK, um, no, I, I knew where the line was. I mean, I'm not a whistleblower. The only reason I can talk about this is that my own government has declassified and released uh, most of its UFO files, but I know where the line is and I, I won't cross that. And, and I think those other people, uh, so for example, now in the US where you have people like Lou Elizondo, um, who, who um, obviously was the point man for the ATIP program. Very interesting. Um, Very interesting. Yeah. He knows where the line is as well, and he's not going to cross it. He's not a whistleblower. People like he and I take our security oaths extremely seriously. Uh, firstly, because we know the consequences if we don't. But secondly, I think because we're, we're loyalists and patriots, and um, I, I wouldn't dream of doing anything that would, would um, harm, harm my, uh, my country. So 
uh, yeah, I, nobody, nobody has, to answer your question, nobody has had that conversation with me, but probably because I know exactly where the line is and I haven't stepped across it. You know, that brings me to my last point, and John and I have talked about this also too. There's been so many cases, like for example, uh, George Van Tassel uh, from way, way back many, many years ago, he said he had alien contact and he was given technology on how to uh, rejuvenate life where people uh, basically uh, could live to 900 years old if you could rejuvenate your body. Uh, my point being is, is after working on this project for over 20 years, he's about to release, he says he's gonna release the information and all his findings. And then according to his family, if this is true or not, he just mysteriously dies. And his office is ransacked, his files are taken away. And my question to you is, again, being time sensitive for this interview, like if any of this is true, this has happened time and time again, where people who claim to have information or have had contact with aliens or they're about to come out with some releva relevations, and then all of a sudden they just disappear or die in the, their offices. Is this like Hollywood sensationalism or media sensationalism? Or could there be something to it? Not, I mean, not that you wouldn't even know who would be behind it, but is it possible? Like, is this coincidences that this just happens? People just vanish when they're about to, uh, you know, make these statements? Well, I, I'm a little bit skeptical about that, to be honest. I think, um, you know, we've seen plenty of occasions um, over the years where people have dumped highly classified or, and or sensitive things into the public domain, whether it's uh, Edward Snowden or, or Chelsea Manning or whoever it might be. Um, now, absolutely, the state then goes after those people where it can with the full resources of the criminal justice system. I, I think it has to do with, I mean, in the UFO field, there's a real overlap between the kind of conspiracy theory community and the UFO community. So I think part of it is a conspiratorial mindset and, and to be honest, a little bit of paranoia with some of the people. But there's, you know, there's no getting away from the fact that if you Google... Um, a phrase like who's killing all the UFO researchers, you'll, you will find a few stories. Now, I mean, at risk of being glib, everyone dies. Um, and, and even UFO researchers have to at, at some stage. I suppose being clinical about it, you'd need to take a kind of control group of people in other fields of study and see how many of those die in any particular year. Is there a prevalence of these people to die young or in mysterious circumstances. But, you know, I am skeptical. And, and one reason I'm skeptical is that actually, if you do that, I, it would probably bring more attention to the person than if you just ignored them. I mean, if, if why make somebody a martyr? I mean, if, if somebody says that they're about to release some really spectacular UFO information, supposing that happened now, and then next week they were found dead, it would probably make it twice as big a story. But that's what happened years ago with George Van Tassel. His family said that uh, he was, I mean, he was in his early 60s. He was completely healthy. That's if this is the correct information. And they said, you know, he worked over 20 years on this project. I think it was called the uh, Integrator on something. I don't know the exact pronunciation pronunciation, but he built this dome in the middle of the Mojave Desert, and now he made this announcement through all the uh, media outlets, and then two weeks later he was found dead and all his files and everything disappeared. I mean, I, I guess it's possible, but it just seems a little, you know, I don't know, like I believe in coincidences, but not when there's so many one after the other. I'm, I'm like, sure. I'm thinking, uh, John. As you're saying this, I'm thinking you're asking a guy who worked in the Ministry of Defense with the government. Does the government kill people when they when they want information? Like, they say, "Oh yeah, no problem. Let me tell you who did it." <laughs> no, I mean, they, you know, look. I, I mean, at, at risk of of kind of 
sounding like an apologist. No, we don't go around killing people. I mean, we, what what governments do... I'm glad and, you and, told us that, yeah, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> what governments do do if somebody is going to, has or is about to leak classified information is is that they, as I mentioned, with, with Manning and Snowden, though he kind of got away, but uh, what what happens is that the state goes after these people, not not with hit squads and men in black, but with the full resources of the criminal justice system, the police, the prosecutors, etc. Um, and and you know a case is is built, and and that's that's the way it's done. Now I I you know I have obviously heard of Van Tassel and I, I think I wrote about him in one of my early books, but you know what? I think I wrote that book 20 years ago. I right. can't remember if I ever saw a copy of his autopsy. I, I don't know whether the medical examiner took a look. I mean, you know, people they apparently he healthy. Before the family well, was even notified. Well, sad to say, but apparently healthy people in their 60s drop dead all the time. And, you know, most often it turns out that they had some medical condition that that just wasn't diagnosed. But but look, I haven't seen the autopsy report. I don't know if if I don't know what paperwork there was. Joe, while we have you, I have somebody who wants to ask you a question that I'm going to bring in. And I just wanted to show everyone the books that you've written. You've written, am I correct in saying nine books? Um, you know, I think that I think I've only written five. I, I you know what? You know what I think happened at the beginning of the show is that there were different editions of the same book, oh, maybe um, like a different cover, one one US version, one UK version. I mean, us us Brits spelled defense with a C, so you know, and <laughs> and honor with with a, a U in it. And I saw that you got my novel Blood Brothers up there, and it has the the catchphrase. Um, uh, divided by hate, united by no, di uh, united. Yeah, what, whatever it is, but it's got the word honor on there. I'm and a lot of U.S. people, here. yeah, a lot of U.S. people are going, "Hey, he can't spell," but, but it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's a different spelling. That's the first book. That's on UFOs. That's on abductions. That's the one. Van Tassel's in that book. He's in this particular book. Okay, yes. expose of alien abduction phenomena. And then I see this one, the which is my favorite book that you've written. This is unbelievably great, yes. detailed book. Co-written co with two of the main witnesses, John Burroughs and Jim Peniston. Yes, they're right on there. And uh, and he touched the this craft and was downloaded binary information. Yeah, that was that's a fascinating story. And then this book, which was uh, the man who left the mod. Oh, that, ah, you know, that's not a book. That's a DVD. I see. Okay. Thank you. And then Operation... That's, that's my first novel. It's a science fiction novel about alien invasion. Fun fact, that and its sequel are the only sci-fi books ever to have needed security clearance from the government. Yeah, <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Uh, and this, Open Skies, oh, Cold Mind. That's, that's the same as the first picture you showed. It's just a different edition. That's what I have to do. I'm going to take the jokes I write and have them <laughs> rebranded. <laughs> and then there was Blood Brothers, which is my uh, thriller about, that's the one. That's the latest book. Um, I did a lot of other things at the Ministry of Defense apart from UFOs. And um, uh, I can't say much about that, but I was in the Directorate of Defense Security. And that's a thriller about counterterrorism and intelligence. And absolutely, that had to be security vetted. I definitely would like to read that. And anybody, and just to let everyone know, I'm sorry to block your face right there, but if anybody would like to know, by the way, it's COVID. I have to block your face right now for the COVID <laughs> issue. Uh, if anybody would like to know where to get these, you go to nickpope.net and you could actually, uh, from there, you get a link to go to his books, which is um, right here, nickpope.net. Uh, by the way, let me get rid of that out of the way. So I have somebody here in, in uh, that's in Las Vegas and Las Vegas has a lot of activity. And I, we're, well, I'll wrap this up because we're at the hour already now. And I appreciate you staying on longer because um, we, we, we signed up for what, a five minute interview. 
<laughs> three, three and a half, I thought. <laughs> so here is uh, Johnny Preto from Las Vegas, who has a lot of activity, and he has a question for you, if you don't mind. Hello, Mr. Preto. Hey, gentlemen. How are you? I'm great. How's it going? It's good. I saw this post that Johnny posted on his site last week or earlier this week, and I said, oh, no, not another one of these quacky guys. And as I've li listened to Nick for the past hour, he's very thoughtful, very wise, very discerning. So it's a pleasure to hear somebody with uh, a, you know, a thoughtful kind of attitude towards this industry. I was born and raised in Vegas. Uh, I know Bob Lazar, um, grew up with Bob Lazar here and George Knapp and all those guys. Um, so I have my own opinion. And I'm a fellow atheist. Um, but there's certainly life in the universe. I just don't think they've made it to Earth yet, is my personal opinion. But you know, Well, you, you may be right. And that's why, I mean, it, with you coming from Vegas, I'll, I'll use a sort of betting analogy. It's, it's like um, uh, you want to pursue several different strategies if you're going to get the jackpot. If... If we're not being visited, but there's life out there, um, we may find it uh, very soon anyway, for example, through the uh, SETI program and their radio astronomy, uh, the, the big radio telescope the Chinese brought online recently, um, through the search for techno signatures, whether it's alien megastructures or or, you know, it, every few months we get a great new space story, whether it's that funny shaped rock, Oumuamua, coming through our solar system, whether it's Tabby's star, whether it's the fast radio bursts. So cover all the options, absolutely. And, you know, one of my favorite phrases about all this is the skeptics have to be right every day. But the believers only need to be right once. <laughs> I was uh, I was excited. I, I thought for sure that. You were going to come on and unzipper your face and show us your lizard face. I was really excited that that was going to happen. <laughs> no, no lizards here. <laughs> Only Mark Zuckerberg. You know what's interesting, too, is Johnny Preto owns Christian.com. I am the owner atheist. of Christian.com, yes. And oh, you're an atheist. Well. Don't tell anybody. What a paradox that is. <laughs> I believe in Christians. They have lots of money. Uh, I'm going to buy it. What's I'm that, John? Yeah. No, I said I called the atheist hotline and nobody answered. That's right, <laughs> Johnny. That's that's actually a, that's that's a very good joke. Going to give it. A nice. <laughs> uh, well, this is this has certainly been a pleasure. I just want to say I I do I, I you know well I, don't, I shouldn't say when I was a kid I I had I have had two experiences with the UFOs, one and I'm just just for brevity to squeeze this down. Actually, I'm a ventriloquist by trade, and I actually believe in. And, and aliens because I have an alien dummy <laughs> right, right there and here he is in full full motif nice uh, yeah that that that's uh I what's his name John huh what's his name Johnny Preto no brother. And, uh, <laughs> he's a he's a legal man. his name is Jesus so <laughs> it's, um but I was gonna say though I I know that's terrible that's really wrong it's so wrong but I did want to say when I was a kid that's that deserves this I wanted to say that when I was a kid I, uh, I did see something in the sky, a couple, I've had this happen three times in my life. And even my daughter, once when she was a baby in the backyard in broad daylight, there was a, a silver of things just hanging there for a while. And my wife says, quick, quick, get the camera. Look at that. I'm like, what, what the hell is that? And we wrapped the camera and it, it was like gone an instant. And it happened to us once in a parking lot too with another friend of ours. We were just standing there talking and we we're like, and then we saw something and then it took off again. And my friend said to us, did you, did you see what I just saw? And I said, yeah. So I've had kind of a kind of weird experiences with this, nothing earth shaking, but experiences. And then I hear people saying that if you had an experience with a UFO, that perhaps you it's follow in your life and your family's life, it may be repetitive. Do you know anything about that, Nick? Absolutely, yes. Um, particularly in the alien abduction, kind of uh, sub genre, if I can call it that, uh, you get the concept of a repeater uh, abductee, repeater witnesses. Um, absolutely. Yeah. These, these, and people talk about bloodlines and, and things like that. I think obviously alien abduction is much more difficult to nail down than the UFO side of it, where particularly recently we've got forward looking infrared camera videos 
we've got uh, radar data from from the US Navy. Uh, we've got documents from the DIA to Congress about this. Uh, so that's a little bit more easy, I guess, to to validate. Abduction, less so. It's it's more just people telling their stories. But hey, look, you know, narrative and eyewitness testimony is still at the heart of our criminal justice system, even in this day of forensics and uh, closed circuit TV and things. So let's not dismiss it out of hand. And absolutely, there is the idea that for whatever reason, when somebody's had a sighting or experience, they'll come back. Interesting. And Johnny Preto, you said you know Lazar. Yeah. You've met him. And Dim yep. Glasso was also saying earlier today, didn't you say you wanted to ask him about Lazar um, being, he, he's had his stuff taken all away from him as well, just yeah. like you were bringing up earlier. Right, John? Yes, yes. I, I, I did want to mention that with Bob Lazar because it, after he made his claims about working at Area 51 yeah. and all, you know, his office was ransacked, his computers, his files, everything were taken. And again, like if there's nothing there, wow. why would the government or anyone else be interested in confiscating something that doesn't exist. And John, just to interject there as well, this recently happened in the new special that was just out on Netflix with him again. Again, they came in during it, I believe, and raided him. Right, right. So kind of, you know, it's it's one of those things where there's more said in silence when, you know, somebody doesn't say something, you kind of start thinking more about that than what they say. Like, why would the government or anyone be interested in, like, taking his computers, his files, and... And from what I understand, Bob Lazar wasn't interested, like he wasn't trying to make a ton of money. He wasn't, he's a quiet guy, disappeared for 30 years. So it's not like, you know, there was a, an agenda from sure. his part, at least from my knowledge. What, what, what I would say is that, I, you know, I'm not a deep specialist on Bob's story, but I think there are, there are two sides to this. And, um, I think there is a declassified or partially declassified, partially redacted uh, police or, or um, uh, other investigatory report into that seizure. And, and look, you know, um, yes, um, if, if somebody had something like that, I'm sure the government would be interested. But but I think there were some other allegations, too. I don't want to go go there you know, for all sorts of legal reasons. But uh, here's here's the other thing. In any criminal case or in any um, case where the police or the authorities are involved these days, the very first thing they'll do is seize computers and phones and files. I mean, it's, it's just a sort of automatic reaction where, you know, whatever is going on. So it's not necessarily as sinister as it it might sound but um I, as i say that's it, we could probably do a whole show on that and Absolutely. i would love to <laughs> i would love Absolutely. to and, and i think way, just I one other how... comment on that you know i i think it's almost proven that he was at area 51 it just becomes a question of whether he's telling the truth or not yes the, I, the, I i don't think or uh, nobody that's looked into the story in any depth disputes that for a while as a contractor, absolutely, he, he had access to that site. But as you say, the $64,000 question is, is all the stuff about UFOs and aliens true? That, absolutely. well, who knows? It's, it's up to, yeah, it's, that will, we don't know at this point in time. And we may never at this point as well. And this is the, this is the beautiful thing about all the conjecture. One thing I do appreciate, and John, that's a great question, but one thing I do appreciate about you, Nick, is that, you're very pragmatic in your views. You look, you stick with just the facts and you really don't seem to get swayed by your personal opinion. Like you said earlier, you just take the data that's given to you and base information on that. And it, it, I would I would find my emotionally try to, I think emotionally I would have a difficult time remaining such an outside observer. Uh, sure. Sometimes. I find it impressive that you're able to separate yourself from the actual emotions of it. Thank you. Well, you know, I take that as a compliment. I mean, a lot of people in the UFO community, we, I mentioned in response to an earlier answer how a lot of the UFO community are quite suspicious of me. 
Um, I mean, you, you can't do this for the government and not be the bad guy in some people's minds. Um, but I think, yeah, absolutely. When I had the UFO job, but, but in other postings that I did in government, I, yeah, you, you have to be data driven and you have to, for, for example, as, as a civil servant, you have to give even handed advice to you, political leaders of of whichever party is in power, and I've served I've served um, both parties in in the the UK, both mm -hmm. Labour and Conservative governments. And people people say in the UFO community, oh, Nick Pope's on the fence on this. Well, you know, if if on the fence means being even-handed with it and and being data-led, uh, then yeah, I'll take that. Of course. And, and I, it's clear to me the way I could, and in all your answers, I could hear how you're arriving at your, your ideas and arriving at your responses. And, and it's actually appreciated because it, it, it's, every, you know, a lot of people in this business and, and all business, I guess, we're human beings. So we get emotionally attached to the results of how we want to see them. And we also seem to focus as human beings on what we like as opposed to what we don't. Uh, you know, as an example, if you're a Democrat or a Republican in the United States, uh, if you're a Republican, you're going to watch Fox News 24 hours a day because that's what you agree with. Or if it's CNN because you're a Democrat, you may watch another thing because you're you agree with this. We like to fulfill ourselves with what we believe to be the truths. And um, it's hard to be independent sometimes. And I can clearly see that your your MO is that way. And it's appreciated, too. It really is. And I appreciate you spending this time with us and I would love to do it again in the future. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we went over by wow. 15 minutes more than I even planned. Yeah, well, this is, this is such a fascinating question. I mean, one of my other sayings on this is that the question of whether we're alone, it's one of the biggest and most profound questions we can ask ourselves. And it seems to me that we might be edging ever closer to an answer. And that is interesting. And, and, Maybe it's worth overrunning a little for. I hope I see it in my lifetime. Nick, Nick in, in one closing statement, do you see a time in the near future that maybe uh, a UFO might just actually land and like in uh, the, the classic film, Close Encounters or The Day the World Stood Still? Do you like, do you think that that's a possibility down the road or? Yes, why not? And, and, I would say that the trigger point for that would be the, what I mentioned earlier about at the point you can't hide it anymore. And what I mean by that, for example, is the next generation of radio telescopes are going to be so powerful that if there are other civilizations in our little corner of the galaxy, you know, you'll switch it on and it'll light up like a Christmas tree. And at that point, you know, the, the genie's out of the bottle. And at that point, even if there is secrecy now, it then becomes redundant. And that will be when they land on the White House lawn. <laughs> okay. it, is coming. it is coming. I know it's coming. I just don't know if it's going to be good or bad <laughs> in the end. You know, like, every, like everything else that happens. Here. Well, thank you so much. And once again, anyone that would like to get in touch uh, with his books, it's at nickpoke.net. And that'll lead you to another link, which gets uh, you right to over to his books. And he has so many different books here that are great. And apparently from the first one, I, I've actually, this is the one I'm going to look at next. The, that's a story, uh, sci-fi-ish sci type story, you say. Uh, not, that you one's know. not sci-fi. That's the one about counter-terrorism and intelligence agencies going after um, the bad guys. I'm going to buy it and I'm going to watch it and read it and study it. And I'll probably enjoy the heck out of it because I love that kind of stuff as well. well thank you so much for uh, appearing here. We'll send you a copy of this uh, before it goes anywhere and you could change it any way you like. If there's something that you feel. Oh, like no, I, I, I'm never one for censorship like that. I said what Great. I said, um, you know, please feel free to run it as is. Nick. I got to thank you too. It's been a pleasure and it was so nice and you're just a gentleman. Yes, you are. And, and I have you. one closing point to make. You had tweeted, you said that your, uh, your wife is a skeptic. Yes. And John and I would love to know that has to be some intriguing conversation that you guys <laughs> have. 
Do you try to convince her or does she try to convince you about who's right or who's wrong? Neither, be really. Yeah, neither. Because I, 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 look, I did this for the government and now I, I work as a broadcaster and a journalism, um, you know, a journalist and, and I do a little bit of consultancy and spokesperson stuff. So kind of this, this has been my job. So in a sense, Elizabeth being uh, a real skeptic on this is great. And the answer to the question is, we don't really discuss it at all. Um, <laughs> you know, we- Mary, you Mary. John, he yeah. is smarter than we thought. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Once you're married, you don't discuss this stuff. <laughs> you know, and no, we, yeah, this is, this is something that's been my job. So, so I leave that, you, you know, out of, out of the, the home life. And we talk about all the, the other stuff. And as my last comment, just to give you a bit of advice, if you'd like your wife to pay attention to you, whisper in your sleep. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh, my advice would be, please ask her to stop calling me discussing all this stuff. Right. <laughs> Nick, you all are right. certainly a pleasure and a delight. Thank you so, so much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Well, it's, and, uh, it's been great to be on your show, and, uh, and I hope everyone finds this thought-provoking, and whether, whether they agree, disagree, if it provokes discussion and debate and interest, all good. That's thank you. You're a true gentleman. Thanks again. Thank you, Nick. Stay well, healthy, you and your lovely brain. Thank you. Take care. Bye now. Shut up and sit down. Shut up and sit down.